Fair to uh, decent lecture. Okay. Okay. Um, so today I want to briefly summarize the RNAi, big concepts from that, and then also do a deep dive into the Peewee RNAi pathway. So um, let's first just review some fundamentals of RNAi that you probably would have learned from the RNAi lecture. Um, what's, what's the first thing that gets presented to the cell to induce an RNAi response? Yeah, double stranded RNA. So um, let's talk about that. So what is what what's an RNA normal form? Single or double stranded? Double. Single stranded. What did you say double? Yes. DNA is it it's it's more stable in in double stranded, but this is very abnormal. The cell does not normally see double stranded RNA. Um, long sequences of double-stranded RNA. So it's kind of abnormal. Um, and so in many cases, when the cell sees this, it thinks there is perhaps an invading virus or something that's wrong. So it usually tries to find these things uh, and it has means of degrading them. And that's kind of like what we're hacking into with the RNAi system. So there were two major pathways of RNAi um, that I discussed. And the fundamental difference between the two pathways is in the structure of the double-stranded RNA that gets presented to the cell. So one of them was the SI RNA pathway. So this is small interfering RNA. Okay, and in that case, what you're actually seeing are, are actually two strands, two separate strands of RNA complexed together, which is what we're calling dsRNA. Okay, so if the cell sees this, this is what's called small interfering RNA, and it, and it induces this response. Okay, now there's a very, very similar RNAi pathway which is, but it's a little bit different, okay? It's called the MI RNA pathway. So these are micro RNAs. And again, it's, it's similar, but in this pathway, the sort of like bolusing reagent is a single strand of RNA. And what happens is it bends in on itself because there's some complementarity and it induces what we call a hairpin. So when the cell sees either this or this, it can initiate RNAi pathways, but they sort of get funneled into slightly different um, molecular pathways, but the end result is the same. Okay. So once these double-stranded RNAs are presented to the cell, what's the next step in the process? It gets fragmented, please, or nucleus. Yes, so there is typically always a protein called dicer. Okay, and dicer essentially recognizes these and it cuts them up into little small chunks which is why it's called dicer, it's like dicing, dicing these, okay? And then now essentially these two, these two separate sort of starting pathways are kind of now the same thing. The hairpin is essentially like gone. It's just little chunks of double-stranded RNA. And this one is also little chunks of double-stranded RNA. But you see how they started off a little bit different. That's kind of like the key the key difference between the small interfering and the microRNA pathway. Um, and really the, the broad concept that you just wanna remember is really just this, that like if the cell sees double-stranded RNA, it, it induces this process, okay? 
So Dicer does this. Dicer's a nuclease. Um, and then what happens? R not attaches. Yes. So so there's this complex called the risk complex. Okay, and a subunit of that, a subunit protein, so this is a quaternary machine, quaternary structure machine with multiple subunits. And one of the subunits, the key one, is argonaut. That's the protein, okay? Um, argonaut, essentially what happens is argonaut as a, as a part of this complex grabs onto one of these small segments Okay, and then Argonaut and the risk complex essentially get rid of the one strand. So now it's single stranded RNA, little chunk. And now these A's, U's, G's, and C's have exposed hydrogen bonds that are looking for a match, right? And this complex uses this as a means to find its target, which is typically a messenger RNA. And if there's a match, it finds it, and then the risk complex cuts it up. So the way that this would work in an immunity pathway is if there was a single-stranded virus, okay, and maybe maybe the when the virus invaded, the virus had some strange like structure, like RNAs form these weird structures. Maybe there's a situation where Dicer recognizes this as an invading virus. It chunks it up, and then these chunks get fed into Argonaut, and then now if they see any other RNAs that match that virus, it can cut them up. So you can imagine now how this is, this is really the origin of this is a, it's a cellular immunity pathway against viruses, and later we're going to learn about transposons. So the important thing to remember here is um, argonaut is a nuclease. Okay, it's a slice. It has a slicing functionality, and it's targeted by this. Um, microRNA or small interfering RNA. Okay, so some, some common themes, because this, this comes up later. Um, and again, like I, I want you guys to remember sort of like the common themes that you find in biology and biotechnology. And one of the common themes of this pathway and other pathways that we're going to get into is um, if you're ever faced with the scenario of a question of like how to find or target a nucleic acid, how do you solve that problem on a molecular level? Knowing that mechanism and maybe the mechanism of CRISPR, how do you, how do you solve that problem? Like what is the cell doing on a molecular level to find targeted nucleic acid sequences? Using complement. Yes, it's using it's using nucleic acid complements. This is like a theme that you will see in molecular biology now for for many many in many many other cases. Anytime you have to like solve this problem, you find usually a protein that interacts with a single-stranded nucleic acid, okay? And it forms some kind of like a targeting mechanism. This is a common theme that's gonna recur. So now knowing that, now you might understand why I teach RNAi before CRISPR. Why do I teach RNAi before CRISPR? Well, it's, I mean, it's just, in essence, it's the same system, right? Like CRISPR is, Cas9 is a nuclease, just like Argonaut is a nuclease. And in both these systems, 
they're, they're just doing this. They're, they're using, a, in this case, we call it the guide RNA, which is a homing mechanism. In this case, it's the same thing. It's an RNA that's a homing mechanism. So this is, a, again, a pattern. There are nucleases that are guided to a specific site to cut, and the way that they're guided can be complexing with a nucleic acid. And I teach RNAi first because um, RNAi was around sort of like as a tool before the CRISPR systems, but it's in many ways a similar system. And there's a lot of carbonalities that they share. And actually a lot of research was spent into understanding the function of the argonaut protein in hopes that it would have become like what CRISPR did become, if that makes sense. Um, so there was a lot of research put into this. So let's talk about the, now the peewee RNAi pathway and how it's just a, it's a little bit different. Um, so this is just a, like a really interesting system. Um, in the review I read, it said something like, there is a war raging in your testes. Um, and the war is between selfish transposons. And the goal of the transposon is to essentially like copy itself and, and jump and replicate in your germline. And the goal of the transposon, the problem that the transposon has to solve is it has to duplicate itself and it has to get to the next generation. Okay. But typically the host, and we've talked about this for, before in the context of selfish gene theory and in the context of transposons, the host typically like does not want transposons. There's usually like not a use for them. They're in a parasitic DNA, okay? So the host needs to have some defense mechanism against these, and that is the, the peewee RNAi pathway. Okay, it's the cellular defense against transposons. Isn't that the same pathway that target Thielman, or no? Yes. Okay. I'm going to get into that. That's actually my my getting getting to that. So, but it it does more than just P elements. It it targets sort of like many different forms of parasitic DNA. So this system was actually discovered. Okay, and let me let me just um, now it's probably worth discriminating these terms. Peewee. That is the name of proteins that are the that are argonaut paralogs. Okay, so long ago there was a family of argonaut proteins. In the host cell, they became duplicated, they duplicated their genes, and once you duplicate genes, let's say you have argo1 and argonaut2, you've now created a situation where you have redundancy and so these things can start diverging their function. Does that make sense? And in one, there was a split, essentially like a family split. And we call one of the families argonaut and one of the families peewee. Okay, and these have different functions, the argonaut but they're similar, they're the same function, but they have different sort of like pathways, different, different niches, if you will. The argonaut proteins are responsible for SI, RNA, I, and micro RNA, I. And the peewee variant argonaut proteins are responsible for the peewee uh, RNA pathway. So the important thing to remember is peewee that's the same thing as argon. It's a nuclease. It's a protein, it's a nuclease. It gets complexed with some guide RNA and it cuts up transcripts. It's the same thing. It just has a different name. Um, and if you see PIRNA, so the one big difference between SIRNA and the microRNA pathway is these two pathways, the consistency is what gets presented to the cell is some form of double-stranded RNA. In the peewee RNAi pathway, there is a little difference in what the targeting sort of initial stimulus is 
is single-stranded RNA. This is the big. This is one of the big differences. Pee RNAs start off as single-stranded RNAs, and again, this is kind of like a level, a deep level of detail. Um, I'm going into this because that's what the flip flexures offers the opportunity to go into. This is the discriminating factor. Okay, so how was the Pee system identified? So in, it was identified in fruit flies. Many, many of the molecular biology things we know were first identified in fruit flies, which is a testament to the model. Um, and it was identified, the way that it was identified is there was this, pro, there was this gene called stellate. You don't, you don't need to remember this, I'm just, I'm showing you this as, it's an exemplary story of how things are discovered. So stellate is this weird gene in Drosophila, and I'm not sure exactly what it does, it seems to be some form of like parasitic DNA, and if it gets overexpressed, it forms like crystals in the sperm, and it sterilizes the sperm. I don't know enough about the evolution of this thing to understand like why it would ever want to do this or how it came about, but this is what it was doing. And the host fruit fly saw this as a problem. Like if there's a, some kind of parasitic DNA in your genome that's causing sterilization in your sperm, that's an issue, right? And you need to solve that. Otherwise you're not going to ever be able to pass on in your genes. So, in response to this, um, there was um, essentially an upregulation in the Pee system, and on the Y chromosome of Drosophila, they started seeing paralogs, duplications of this gene, which they eventually came to name suppressor of. So they found this section of DNA that had an inhibitory role on this, and they found that this thing kept getting duplicated because you can imagine if it duplicates more and more and more, it's going to suppress this more and more and more. So this was like sort of like the, the fix, the solution that the host evolved to, to prevent this problem is let's like suppress this gene. And the way that it suppressed it, we later found out that these loci that were being duplicated over and over and over and over were loci that contained PI, RNA, essentially genes. So these are the genes that synthesize the single-stranded RNA, which gets loaded into the Pee-wee protein. And so Pee-wee plus this gene suppressor of stellate, we're able to form a complex and then go and chop up transcripts of this gene. So the peewee pathway was originally identified as a suppressor of this sort of like toxic gene. That's how it was identified. Um, and later we found out that the peewee RNA I pathway had multiple roles, not just the suppression of the stellate gene, but also suppression of, as was mentioned, the P elements. So P elements are, to review, transposons. We use them in fruit flies to insert transgenic genes. And the Punnett square looks like this. Let's say you have female, female, male, male, and let's say blue is plus P element, and white is minus. Okay, in this case, they mate, nothing happens to the offspring, they're, they're fine, they live. This is just like normal wild type. In this case, 
In this mating, they survive. And I'll explain this in a second. This mating is the mating that's a problem. This is very similar to like CI. Very similar to the CI. It's the same sort of Punnett square of, as the CI system. Okay. In this case, if you have P elements in the male, they're like loaded into the sperm. And then when this mating happens and the uh, sperm combines with the egg, the P elements go crazy and they shotgun the genome and these embryos die. And the actual term for this, if you remember, is hybrid dysgenesis. These die, okay? And in the case of this, there's kind of a rescue. There's a rescue, sort of like a rescue element. And what's the rescue element? What, what is the key rescue element that allows this cross to survive? But what is the antidote specifically in the context of this? It's the peewee. It's the peewee, yeah. So actually what happens is peewee is a maternal effect gene, and the mother loads her eggs with peewee protein. And if the mother has been exposed to pea elements in the past, some of those peewee proteins are complex with P element matching single-stranded RNA, okay? And if this is the case, these get loaded into the egg as a maternal effect gene, and then when this sperm combines, they're ready to silence. So these survive or are, I guess, quote-unquote, rescued. So again, very similar to CI. Um, and now you can imagine now you can sort of understand, in the context of that, this is an interesting point. You should really now be able to understand how selfish elements can spread, right? This is exactly the same as CI, and CI causes will block it to spread into populations. So would you expect P elements to also spread into populations based on this Punnett squared? Why, why no? Should be yes, this is the same thing as CI. Yeah. Like you would rather you would rather be the female who has been exposed to this transposon in the past because now you're sort of like immune to it and you're going to kind of like have an advantage. So P elements actually can like spread into the population despite the fact that they cause this weird like sterility. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's it's also selecting on the female, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's 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 really fascinating. Um, so does that peewee maternal effect that the, the girls have, it, it, it stops the sterility by stopping the that, that was in a different gene. So now we're talking about two different things. So, so the peewee pathway is a, it's an RNA suppression pathway. It's an RNAi knockdown pathway. But it, it can knock down multiple targets depending on what targeting beacon you load into it. And so in that case, the crystallization protein, the, the complex would look a little bit different. It would be peewee protein, but the targeting RNA would be the, a little section of the stellate gene. Does that make sense? And then now what it's knocking down is that, that problematic gene. In this case, what it's knocking down is the problematic transposon. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think I just missed the... Essentially, what you want to understand is the peewee protein is an immunity framework. And it's just sort of like antibodies in the sense that antibodies can be built up to recognize many different things. Peewee is the same thing. It's a protein, it's a nuclease, and you can target it to many different problematic things in the germline. One of which is P elements or other transposons one of which is that other stellate gene that we talked about. Is that, the, the, whatever insect, whatever does it by itself, they hook up with the peewee and it takes care of the problem. Say, say that again. So whatever insect or whatever has it, then they, they hook up with the peewee to, to solve whatever problem they have? So, so let me show you how, the, let me try to draw out how this happens, because it's actually really in, interesting how the sort of like immunity is built up. Um, let, me, let me try to like physically draw out, and then maybe I think you'll understand a little bit better. So 
because this is actually really cool. So imagine you have a chromosome of Drosophila, okay? And Drosophila will, Drosophila will like dedicate a little region, okay? And this region we have given a name called PI RNA clusters, okay? And in these clusters, so imagine we have a subset like here on a chromosome that corresponds to these PI RNA clusters. In these clusters, they stick in a bunch of kind of like random promoters going in like different directions, okay? And this is, what this is, is this is like a, almost like a trap. It's like a catching trap. And what they're hoping for is, what do transposons do? They jump, they jump around. So what they're hoping for is if a P element or a problematic gene jumps in here, there are promoters now that are designed to essentially assemble single-stranded RNA that can get, that is equal to PI RNA, that can get loaded into the PUE protein. So as soon as a P element jumps into this little catch trap, a promoter will cause it to synthesize a single-stranded RNA molecule, which gets loaded into PUE, and now the PUE is effective at suppressing that thing. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's just something that now knows it. Yeah, okay. yes. It, it now knows like that, it, it knows its sequence, um, and it's set up in a way that now its sequence is turned against it by funneling it into this immunity pathway. And this is really interesting because this is the same thing as what? This is the same thing as CRISPR. CRISPR is clustered, regularly interspaced. Uh, repeats. Repeat, palindromic repeats. What's the S? Is it small? I think it's small. Maybe it's just interspaced. It's clustered regularly interspaced palindromic repeats. This is the same thing. So what bacteria do is on a bacterial genome, again, what's like the big enemy of bacteria? Bacteriophages. Bacteriophages, viruses. And what they have is they have these little regions where they store these clustered sections of past viruses. So like if a virus invades the bacteria, they have means of recombining little segments of that virus genome into these regions, okay? And it builds up a whole bunch of these sort of like, again, clustered, regularly interspaced palindromic repeats, which are matches of past viruses. And there's promoters in here and it can synthesize these, okay? And these, these RNAs then get complex with the Cas9, which is a homing nuclease. And then this nuclease, nucleic acid complex can attack viruses that match these sequences. Does that make sense? These are like the same thing, They're the same thing. And in the past I've talked about, um, quote unquote, if you look at genomes, that most interesting, the most common thing you see is like dead transposons. This is actually like a functional use for those sequences of dead transposons. You find these PI RNA clusters um, around those graveyards of transposons because every sort of dead transposon is a new, like, um, is a transposon that they're now immune against if they've rigged it up into the PUE system. Does that make sense? So I feel like RNAi is like a good introduction to CRISPR because it's, it's like essentially like the same thing. 
interest for uh, through yogurt. Through yogurt? Yeah, that's. I'm going to do a lecture on uh, a flip lecture on the history of CRISPR. Let's save that for our Monday. Don't put me on the spot. <laughs> um, that's kind of it. Do you guys have other questions about RNAi? Or like, was there anything confusing from that lecture? Well, there's, there's two sort of like storing functions I could envision. One sort of like quote unquote storing would just be the complex. The complex of peewee or risk, the risk complex with its, with its like corresponding thing. But this is not stored permanently. It's only stored permanently if it's been inserted into the genome under the control of a certain like promoter. Does that make sense? Yeah, what, what makes the difference in whether it's stored permanently or not? Well, it's got to get in the, it's got to get into the DNA. So for, imagine, let's, let's talk about various scenarios. It's good. Let's try to envision various scenarios of how these would effectively be stored in the DNA. And it's just like what I said. So for Peewee, Peewee it would be stored in the DNA under the condition where one, a transposon or problematic gene jumps into a region that is responsible for transcribing PIRNA. So if there's a special promoter that is set up to make PIRNA and a transposon jumps in near it. Now it's going to be coding single stranded RNA that can get complex with PU immediately. This would create a scenario where now it's memorized that because it's in the DNA. And anytime this DNA gets replicated, it's going to get replicated and passed on the next germline. And if this is an important function, it's going to be selected for. So once it jumps in, if it's useful, it's never going to leave. Does that make sense? And in the case of these other ones, so like SI RNA or the micro RNA, you could envision the same scenario where what do viruses do? Viruses, many viruses have two different life stages, lytic versus lysogenic, and in one stage, they actually integrate into the genome. So you could imagine a scenario where a virus as part of their infection, integrates into the genome and if the host can somehow evolve a way to turn this little section of virus into double-stranded RNA, one way you might do this is you somehow evolve a promoter here and you somehow evolve a promoter here. Now you're perpetually synthesizing forward and reverse transcripts, which will complex together. And this can get then loaded into the, well, get dicered, and then loaded into the risk complex. And that if this virus ever tried to invade again, or any virus that was had a similar sequence, it would now be immediately chopped up. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm trying to do it through our Well, in, in, if you're talking about like the human immune system, yeah, that's what I was trying to. So, so that, so that's a little bit different. Although, yeah. although, oh, let me let me say that these systems are conserved in essentially all animals. So we have our own risk PV pathways. Mice have them. We have them too. So, but this is sort of a different system than our sort of um, memory immune system. The way that our immune system that we think about when we think of immune system works is if we get invaded by a virion or a virus, it's usually there's some kind of like a coat and the coat is made up of some particular protein 
And we have proteins called antibodies, which are synthesized, and they have a special region that can be varied, and they develop immunity by recognizing the outer coat proteins of viruses. And then once this gets recognized, usually there's like, right, like the white blood cells, which can then find this and then like eat it, right? So this is a different, it's a different, a totally different mechanism of like immunity. Um, you might envision this as like, this, this is an immunity pathway that protects the, like the individual organism on an individual level. These are, these immunity pathways are kind of like immunity pathways that protect the genes. They protect the, the germline and they protect like sort of the, the code, if that makes sense. Yeah. Any other questions? So I have a question that might sound crazy. Okay. But, uh, how do you think the buildup of all those gene sequences contribute to like overall evolution or do they at all? So if you get a bunch of like stored sequence, I mean, could that ever cause like any kind of micro evolution even? Well, so there's, there's going to be for sure some kind of like a cost benefit analysis. Like our genomes are going to be collecting things like viruses um, and they perhaps they're like in a broken pseudogenized state and they're going to be collecting transposons in like a broken pseudogenized state and these will perpetually collect. And you can imagine there's going to be some benefit to keeping these around if they're under the condition that you've sort of your your body or your D genes have somehow like built in the systems where now they can be used to funnel into like the risk complex or the peewee complex in that case they'd be useful so in that case then there's going to be purifying selection that essentially keeps this intact and every time your sort of like offspring would be exposed to this type of virus, they would have an advantage. So there's going to be purifying selection that's going to keep this around. If there's a situation where, um, say like this transposon has just like copied over and over and over and over and over again, and you have like tens of thousands or uh, maybe like a thousand copies of it, you can imagine now that this is gonna be a pretty big cost because every time you have to replicate the DNA for the next generation, you're replicating an extra thousand genes that does nothing for you. So that's gonna be uh, a cost and there's gonna be no purifying selection so that if say an event happens where there's a deletion, there's gonna be no cost. And so you would expect that that would be quote unquote streamlined over generations and, and it would be, the code would essentially be stripped clean, be cleaned out. Um, but you're always gonna wanna keep around a few things, you know what I mean? Like you, you wouldn't wanna strip them all out. So there's gonna be like a cost benefit. Is there a point when like you haven't, it hasn't been used in such a long time that it forgets it? Well, it never like makes a decision. What what's happening is there there would be a situation where the evolutionary pressure disappears. So imagine like imagine there's some scenario where the virus, whatever this virus is, it goes extinct and it's like not on the planet anymore. There's never ever going to be a situation where that's useful. And so eventually just by just by natural processes, you're going to generate offspring that have maybe a deletion there or progressively just sort of like lose this and they're never going to be there's never going to be a penalty for that because that virus is like it's gone now um so essentially the the key thing is like for this to happen and to you for you to retain things like this there has to be consistent evolutionary pressure to keep them which would mean like you always are in, again, like the raging war would be continuing. You'd always be at risk of new, like similar transposons coming in, and then it would be useful to keep things like this.
Um, I don't know if I answered your question. Okay. What about like within an individual? Like you said, like to the offspring, but would deletions happen like over the span of a lifetime? That's an interesting question, and that does bring up something that I forgot to mention, which is somatic versus germline. Like the somatic tissues are going to be important to you. That's like your skin. That's like your eyes, your brain. Um, and the peewee systems in some um, organisms have evolved somatic functionality. So what you're suggesting must be true on some level, that there, there must be some utility to using these in somatic tissues, but it's not always, that's not always the case. Um, your question was, is there ever a scenario where, like, on the individual level, this is useful? Is that what you're saying? Like, would a deletion happen? Would a deletion? Like, if. So you could imagine, I'm just, like, like, thinking of, like, within memory. One generation. Within one. Like, within. Well, like, certainly, like, like, if you're thinking about, like, cancer cells, um, cancer cells, like, rapidly become aneuploid and drop whole, like, sections of chromosomes. So for sure, there's going to be, especially in cancers, there's going to be situations where like big chunks of chromosomes just like completely disappear. Mm -hmm. And that's why they become cancerous. Um, and you're going to accumulate those things throughout your life. Every time a cell is going to divide, there's a random probability of something bad happening, right? And so as you get older, yes, you're just going to perpetually accumulate deletions but it's not going to be just these things it's going to be probably deletions of other things too that are really important which is why sort of like you age in the long term um yeah okay